Hello, hello. Today we are going to be talking about configuration synchronization and immutable infrastructure. What is the best for today and what you're going to be using tomorrow? And you might be thinking that configuration synchronization is a thing of the past. Have a couple of surprises for you downstream. And uh, with this presentation, I had a little bit of trouble and uh, the trouble started with a DevOps roadmap. You know, the, everything that surrounds DevOps nowadays, it's very tool centric. And if we take this DevOps roadmap in particular, you could see we learn programming language, then we start to lo look into process management and tools, 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 tools again, even more tools. And uh, that's why we end up with a job advertisement that looks like this. You know, it's, it's all about tools. So you basically called to do tools, but is it so really? Like, is it, is it what we after, right? Are we being paid for doing Kubernetes? I would argue not. We are, we are being paid for solving business problems. And in order to solve them efficiently, we need to be thinking in terms of processes and best practices. We need to understand them. And this is like the end of that roadmap. And here on the top, you have learn infrastructure as code, one block. But I believe there should be much more things in there. There should be much more blocks because it's so important to understand. But how, how, how on earth I would explain it? It's, uh, you know, for me, it is important because I'm, I'm quite nerd when it comes to the infrastructure and doing it right way. But why would you care? I mean, why is that is so important? Exactly as I said before, um, there are typical business needs and problems, right? That you are not being hired because the company wants to do Kubernetes, company wants to do money. And uh, there are problems or challenges associated with that. For instance, systems that they use online to process whatever they do and provide the services they provide, is not able to scale to meet the demand. Or maybe developers are not able to ship changes fast enough or reliably enough. That's why the competition is taking over. Maybe it's hard to manage the system or maybe it's just too big to be managed or maybe it's not even fit in someone's head. There are also disaster recovery and fragile system concerns, right? As well as security and compliance. So also valid business concerns and the challenges that it needs to be addressing. And we should be starting to think about those problems first and only that coming to processes and only that, when we understand the context, processes, and principles, start picking up the tools. However, it's it's kind of hard to explain if I would start from the theory. So I thought I would take you on a journey, how it would look like for the typical company. And through that, hopefully you will understand where I'm coming from. So let the journey begin. And I'm Andre Devatkin. I will be taking you on that journey. I'm a cloud engineering specialist. I'm focusing on AWS and HashiStack. Thus, in this uh, presentation, you're going to be seeing most of the examples that will revolve around using AWS and HashiStack, but the same is applicable to other systems. I'm a co-founder at 5XL, the cloud engineering consultancy. I do quite a lot of public speaking. Also, if you like what you hear today, you could tune up to the podcast I produced together with a friend. It's tfsecops.fm. And just recently, I got nominated as a HashiCorp ambassador for all the talks I did around the HashiCorp world. So here's our typical company. and. Uh, it's a business, they have an idea, they maybe have one or two developers. And they started from going to the cloud, doing a click ops, creating some virtual machine, and then they would just, you know, install Nginx in there with Let's Encrypt. They will copy the code continuously. And this is how they serve their application. Every server will have an IP address because everything is IP address based and the service will have names. Yeah, and you might notice that here we have a new prod. You might ask, well, what happened to the old prod? That's a good question. The old prod gets so bloated with the different files that got copied there, the packages that got installed for testing purposes, or maybe like troubleshooting activities because something broke. That was just impossible to manage. So they decided, well, 
we better start from scratch. So they just dumped the old prod and configured the new prod. And this is very typical. We see that a lot, really. Then the company starts to get more traffic. And on the picture on the top, you might notice a sign of the AWS ELB. But that's not really ELB. I, usually, people just boot up another virtual machine and move the Nginx to another virtual machine to serve as a load balancer. Then that Nginx will have a static configuration with the IP addresses of the machine that would serve the traffic. They're still copying the code on those servers. And things are kind of going well. I mean, we we quite often talking to the companies, they want to change and they do a lot of tests and they can see that they can actually serve a lot of traffic through even such simplistic setup. So you always have to wait in. Will you have return on your investment? Maybe with the current traffic, maybe for the current use case, that's good enough. Maybe you don't need more. Well. In this particular case, the company is growing, they're getting more and more servers, they have to constantly update the Nginx configuration to add new IP addresses, they're having more servers to manage, now they need to copy the code to more servers, they also have this prod TMP, where they wanted to test something, but it didn't go as planned, but the server just got there, I mean, they just failed to delete it, or like forgot to delete it. We see it all over again. I mean, we're coming to the company to help as consultant. This is what we often see. That's kind of a re reality. And then they would try to automate when it's getting too much to manage, right? They will do a, an attempt to automate it somehow. And they will pick something that developers heard of, something they might use before. In our particular example here, developers heard about Ansible, tried that before. So they're just using Ansible to provision those servers, deploy updates and copy the code and then maybe restart the servers. It's kind of consistent, not exactly, but it's getting there, it's better than it used to before. Now it's more automated, it takes less work and scaling is still manual. But again, it might be good enough for the time being. So you have to see where your business are, right? And quite often we actually coming during this moment. So where they, feel that they need to redo their setup. And let's deconstruct what we are seeing here, because right now we were just following the progress without thinking what is actually going on. And I think now it's the perfect opportunity to dig in into a little bit of theory here so we could put it into the terms. First, we have to talk about configuration drift. And configuration drift is what we call entropy of the servers. Right, so you have entropy of the systems and the physics. In uh, IT, we have a configuration drift, which pretty much the same. So there are changes done to the servers. They're done manually. They're done on an ad hoc manner. And over time, they accumulate, causing the server to diverge from the intended configuration. Thus, we're getting more and more configuration drift. Eventually, as uh, configuration drift accumulates, we're getting to the point where the server is so bloated with those changes, so bloated with the uh, configuration drift, that becoming unique snowflake, which is impossible to recreate. Probably all of you had that situation in your career where there would be a server that no one is allowed to touch because people are just afraid that the server will fall apart. Making changes to those servers are very painful. It's uh, it's scary. I mean, you change something and you have no idea how to go back because you have no idea how, how it got to the point where it is right now. And uh, so this is what we don't really want to have. And this is what happens when you manage servers manually. Or like maybe if you're alone, you're, it's not that bad since you have all of that in your head if you do it continuously, but you still can forget. But as soon as you have multiple people managing servers, doing things in parallel, things tend to be quite chaotic and you need a better process. And this is how it's demonstrated, right? So you do more manual changes, more configuration drift, eventually getting a Snowflake server. And this is where people thought, all right, so doing it manually is bad. Let's try to use some tools. And people came up with a server configuration management tools and such as Puppet, Chef, Ansible, Salstack, there are others. 
So those tools, they automate provisioning and they are focused on provisioning. Like today, some of them like Ansible, they can do much more. So you could, they can even go to the AWS and call AWS APIs. But initially, those servers were intended to automate provisioning. So instead of you going to server, there is a tool that goes to the server and executes command based on the specification. Most of those tools require some kind of additional configuration. You either have to update uh, firewall so the server can get to the server, or you have to install agent. And some of those servers allow you to track configuration drift, like uh, Chef used to do that. And what happens is you have an image that you apply that image to the server, and then you run your provisioning tool to apply configuration continuously. But your configuration, Synchronization tool will focus on a subset of files that you have on the server, and there will still be some files that are not managed by the, by the tool. So you still have a possibility for configuration drift to occur and accumulate. Thus, we might get ourselves into the automation, the automation fear spiral. And it works in this way that like you might have some production accident you have to log into the server and change something by hand. Your server becoming inconsistent with your specification, but then you're afraid, you're afraid of running your uh, server uh, configuration synchronization tool because you're afraid that it will break the server. And now you have this evil loop because then the next change you do, you do it by hand, server becoming even more inconsistent and you're spiraling down to the Snowflake server state. So you should avoiding that as much as you can. And I'm pretty sure many of you will recognize this pattern. You may be were in that situation before. So going back, now we could see what's going on, right? So they are fighting configuration drift, which is happening since they are trying to do that, to do all the updates manually. They're trying to bring configuration synchronization to, to, to manage that. And they still have challenges of those automation uh, spiral fear thingy, right? And the configuration just still, still accumulates. So we should ask ourselves, is it the best thing to do? Can we do something else, right? And uh, that's, uh, I would say, one of the possible scenarios where the company could go. Another thing we see often that people would also start to do containers. So instead of nowadays, I, back in the day, so if I would follow the progression of the time, how people came up with the different paradigms, we would take a different role, but I, I, I'm showing you how the things are today. And people, next steps they take, they usually take, do containers. And containers are great because the container image is immutable. It cannot change. Another thing that comes with a container is that the container comes with all its dependencies already pre-installed within the image. So you don't need to install all of that to the operating system that runs containers, which means that operating system itself needs very little changes. You pretty much need to install container engine, maybe some additional tools like maybe uh, intrusion detection system or maybe some log, uh, log agent, something like that. But you don't need to install any application dependencies since it comes within the image and then all configuration drift that is associated with that particular application is encapsulated within the container. So when you discard the container, you discard configuration drift together with that. And uh, well, there is still configuration drift on uh, operating system level, but it's much less, which means that you could automate more. And uh, what we actually more often see that the people still have those manually configured provision servers, but they would have Docker running in there and they would log in to those machines and run Docker Compose uh, or like just run Docker to boot up those images or like create uh, or pull the new version and run that. And apparently from here, leaping to the container orchestrator is kind of obvious next step, but in many cases, the teams are small, they mostly contain developers and for developers, container orchestrator is a new skill that they might often not possess. And this is where we usually come in and start to re uh, re redo the architecture to introduce orchestrator and rethink it. But 
it's happening quite often in the real world today. I mean, like a lot of companies are doing it, still doing it today this way. And now we could ask, can we do better? Like even with this setup, right? Can we do better? And yes, so there are things that we could be doing. Like for instance, if you running in a, in a cloud like AWS, you could actually do after scaling group, right? So instead of provisioning those servers manually, you could have pre-baked image that after scaling group will deploy for you. And then you will be able to scale in and scale out based on a load. There is no need to SSH, there is no need to install anything. Well, you might ask, how do I get my changes there, right? One way is through the launch template. So you could have a base like Ubuntu image, but then you can have a launch template that will have all your script things that needs to be installed there, like starting Docker in a launch template. And then it's kind of automated. There is no pet names for the servers because servers comes and go. So that's getting you in a quite good place. And uh, this is how it's done today. But if you take historical perspective after the configuration uh, management tools, people thought, aha, uh -huh. so now we do configuration synchronization, but how, how can we deal with the configuration drift that accumulate on the server? And this is the idea they came up with. So they would boot up the server, they would use their configuration synchronization tool to apply changes continuously. But then at some point they will discard that server, like the virtual machine, right? And they will create a new virtual machine, apply configuration using uh, configuration synchronization and start apply it again. But by doing so, they discarded all the configuration drift that accumulated in that virtual machine. And uh, by doing it often, they're not allowing too much configuration brief to accumulate. So, and uh, now you might be asking like, all right, so does it mean that I could just stick with my Ansible and get most of the benefits of immutable infrastructure? I would say probably yes, because if you are dogmatic, yeah, you have to do everything by the book, but that might take more effort. And uh, just you know, discarding your virtual machines on a regular basis and recreating them through Ansible or what have you is the first good step because it first of all allows you to test your Ansible scripts to make sure that they actually work from the scratch. And also you continuously discarding the configuration drift. So it definitely you're very close to doing immutable infrastructure. So still the after scaling is not available for you since when you scale up, you will have to run Ansible somehow to provision the, the, the virtual machine on the server. So then people came up with the idea of immutable server. So we take everything and we just bake it in into the image. Then we apply image on the virtual machine on the server. And then we don't change it. No one goes in. And when we need to do a change, we will be doing change to the virtual machine image instead. And then provisioning the new virtual machine from updated image. And then no one goes into that one. And we just discard the old virtual machine. And this is a immutable infrastructure in nutshell. This is how it works. So how do you get those images? The easiest way is to have a golden image, right? So you could just uh, boot the virtual machine, do some configuration, save the image. You have a new base, base image. You need to change it. You boot it up, change by hand, save it. You have a new image. You could run your configuration synchronization tools and just save it. You've got the image. You can run HashiCorp Packer with pretty much after made the procedure. It boots up the virtual machine, does all the changes you need, and then save that as a new virtual machine image for you to use. And now you've been, you might be asking like, well, how do I go about the secret and the logs? There are so many things that go into the virtual machine. It's not only the code, right? And um, yeah, we, we need to look into that. So we need to deal with the dynamic configuration. We need to deal with the secrets. We need to understand how do we keep people away and uh, what if they need to troubleshoot. So let's start with the secrets. You have a chicken and egg problem, right? So you have a zero secret problem. And the good thing is that the cloud providers, they quite often let you to solve that through the um, different ways. Like for instance, you can have IAM instance profile for your EC2 instances in your AWS or so that any workload 
running on that EC2 might assume the role from that instance and get a temporary credentials. And through that, you get access to the cloud API and can do more things. Some people might encrypt the secret into the archive and then bake it in. And then when you're booting up, the decryption key is only available where the server is. So it might be like HSM model, or you might use cloud KMS to decrypt it. You might use a secret management so software like HashiCorp Vault or AWS Secret Manager and then pull in as a system boots up, right? So there are, there, there are ways to, to get around it and they're quite developed today. So that's usually not a problem. Then the people, what do we do about the people? So we actually want people to make trace. So we want to keep a possibility to log into the machine. People should, should not have to but we want to be able to, if we have to, but it should be a loggable event. So we want to disable it. So people have to enable it in order to get in. And that will generate a traceable event. And then we could also configure our system to actually kill virtual machine after someone got in. And I know many companies that actually do that. So as soon as, as, soon as someone SSH, they will start a timer like for 30 minutes or an hour. And then after that time period, they will rotate virtual machine to make sure that there are like no configuration drift or any malicious stuff left behind. As for the debugging, you basically need to stream out everything so people don't need to go to that machine, right? So you want to stream out all the metrics, all the logs. So you will have to have some kind of agent running in there to do that. You might wanna record uh, all the system call and uh, sessions through like maybe something like audio D and stream that to the, to the centralized server. So again, if there, is, um, if there is a security incident, you have all this information. You might even save the virtual machine image before you discard it, just in case if you have to go and troubleshoot something or if, the, or if there were like a, a security incident and you need to go back. And uh, if you need to test something, just boot up the another virtual machine because it's going to be the same as in production science. You're doing immutable infrastructure and test there and make sure to clean it up. So you could apply the CI thinking for the infrastructure, right? So you have everything versioned. You produce uh, virtual machine images in a, in a fully automated process, keeping people out of the loop because people are messy. You could automate testing of your infra by booting up those images. And then you would uh, build and promote instead of rebuilding all the time. So it's because you don't, you won't just build once and then reuse many times. You want to deploying often to make sure that you not accumulating the, a lot of changes, you're avoiding the big bang. And another thing is deploying regularly. So you might have some systems that do not, uh, do not change as often. And what you want to do is you actually want to rotate server virtual machines there on a regular basis just to make sure that there is no configuration drift accumulating, even if you don't have any changes. You could just, you know, rebuild the virtual machine, install all the latest updates in there and rotate it on a weekly basis. And that makes intruders, I, I, it, it complicates life for intruders in your infrastructure because it's very hard for them to get a foothold since everything is, is changing all the time and being patched, you also automatic your patching process. So if you have security audit and they ask, what is your patching process? So we just rotate all the virtual machines and boot up new ones that are fully patched. It's just amazing from the security perspective. And if you put all of that in practice, right? So you might use HashiCorp Packer and keep in mind that it's only, not only cloud, you can build uh, virtual machines for virtual box, for QMO, for KVM, for VMware, you can deploy it through Terraform into different uh, targets, not, not necessarily in the cloud. Again, you can deploy it to the VMware if you have it, OpenStack, or if you're running BioMetal, you can take those images and deploy it through PXT. You're securing that by pulling secrets in, and then you have some agents to debug it and stream all debug information out of that. So this is how you do immutable infrastructure. And as I said, the benefits are, you have minimal uh, configuration drift, it's highly scalable. It's great for security science. It's really hard to get any changes in. And also, if when you, I mean, 
they're not changing. So when you have security incident, you can come in and just compare image with what you got. And if there are any changes, most probably that was an intruder making it. Also, when it comes to the cost, you might use primitives like spot instances. Since your system is, is ready to be shut down and recreated, so you could you, you could easily using uh, uh, EC2 spots and saving a lot of money. But can we do even better than that? We actually can. There are container operating systems. And I'm using here AWS Bottle Rocket as examples. There are other, other ones like Coros, I think was one of the most popular ones. I believe it's dead now, but there is a Red Hat Atomic and a couple of others that you could be using. And just look at description and the principles of AWS Bottle Rocket. It's API access to configure your system. No running shell, not, nothing like that. You're just calling the API and feeding a TOML file describing how system should be configured. You have updates based on uh, partition flips. So the partitions are immutable. And when you're doing the update of operating system, you're just getting a new partition, moving over to that one. If it doesn't work, you're rolling back to the previous. And then the old one is being discarded. Amazing. It's immutable by default. There is like no place for configuration drift to ac accumulate. It's a model configuration. And it, there are automated updates for it that you don't need to do. You don't need to log in and install them. Security is a top priority and written in Rust. So uh, all, all the software that runs in there and automates uh, deployments and stuff, it's written in Rust. So there is very, it's memory safe. And there are a lot of security issues from buffer over, overruns. So it's just pure amazing. And if you go into the readme, you could see the packaging. It's a minimal operating system. It has a kernel, JLibc. It has a uh, build chain. It has a loader, system init system, networking. You have a execution environment for containers. And then you have like kubelet and AWS AI modificator for EKS flavor and ECS agent for the ECS flavor. It's pretty much it. There is not much more. It's very small attack surface, right? And there is no, no shell, no interpreters installed, which means it's really hard for intruders to get around and pivot from there, saying their capabilities are limited. Plus, you have all of the security features in there. So it's a lot of boilerplate work done for you. The system is mutable and secure, and this is how you want it. Can we do even better than that? Well, there is a move towards micro VM and unikernels, right? Like, um, for instance, you have a Firecracker from AWS, which is micro VM, or like Includos, which is the unikernel. And those uh, unikernels are single process, special purpose operating systems that compile into one executable and run on top of the hypervisor. So you don't have any guest operating system, nothing. It's very minimalistic. It does what it's only need to do to serve your application. And there is even less stuff to exploit. But we are not exactly there, right? So this is how it looks like. With uh, Linux containers, you have awesome kernels. Those are shared between, between containers. You still might have a hypervisor because most often we run containers inside the virtual machine. But with uh, unikernels or micro VMs, you basically have application linked together with everything it needs to run, and it runs on top of the hardware or hypervisor. And well, yeah, unikernels are great, but we are doing Kubernetes, right? So, and it pretty much it will get us a little bit of time while we get there. And uh, now, when we know about immutable infrastructure, when we know about configuration synchronization, let's have a look what's going on in a Kubernetes land. And you might notice that, hey, we actually doing configuration synchronization today, which called GitOps. It's pretty much a new shelf. So we have a repository that defines what we need to have in uh, in a Kubernetes cluster, and then we synchronize that to the Kubernetes cluster. So we again doing configuration synchronization. Now we can think, is it what we should be doing? And you know, GitOps has a number of problems with that. So for instance, when you're doing the Kubernetes, it's fine. But when you start to run something like cross-plane to, to run your AWS infrastructure through GitOps, cross-plane will generate a lot of API calls and you're paying for those. 
you have a broken feedback loop for developers because GitOps just takes over from the CI pipeline, and then it's a little bit unclear for the developer when his change being being uh, deployed. There is a problem with branching. I will be talking more about that, and there is a configuration drift that still accumulate. A uh, technology radar from Softworks that came out a couple of days ago actually recommends that you hold GitOps for a while because if you do branches for environments, you might get yourself into trouble. So read that one. So we should be asking ourselves, how do we do immutable infrastructure for Kubernetes or if it's even like a right way to go, right? Because we could see that through immutable infrastructure, we could get a great resilient systems. Configuration synchronization, might be a necessary evil to take a next step, but at this point, it's a little bit unclear what it's gonna be. So probably for the best for today will be a setup like this, when you have container operating system like AWS Bottle Rocket running in after scaling group, or maybe you're running Fargate and you don't have any instances, you're deploying containers because they're mostly immutable, and then you're using some managed or your own orchestrator. And through that, you have uh, automatically scalable, in and out, uh, resilient, self-healing system. And that's pro pretty much the best what you could get for today. I'm gonna do, a, well, I'm running a little bit out of time. So I'm gonna skip a couple of slides that gives you a theoretical background. So I, I wanted to do a little bit of summary here for, for infrastructure as code and what it's mean, but in my presentation, we have a link down here that will take you to the free chapter of Infrastructure's code book, and it covers everything I had to say here. So I'm gonna be skipping through the goals and principles and practices of immutable infrastructure and moving to the recap phase. So we started from talking about tool-centric culture and how we need to actually dig into the history and the principles and think about the principles and the problems that business faces, right? We need to focus on the business problems and the principles, and that will guide us to the right tool to use. We shouldn't be starting from the tool in the first place. And as we said before, those are the typical business problems and needs. We are not be able to scale as fast as we would like to be able to do. And uh, developers might have hard time shipping the shipping changes, the systems becoming too large because they come, uh, because they're too large and there are a lot of configuration drift. We have disaster uh, recovery concern and security and compliance. And, configura and configuration synchronization might get us as a first step. It might be like, you know, 80-20 rule where you're getting some benefits by doing very little. But as we saw, there is still a possibility for configuration drift. The scaling pretty much manual. It's often used in bare metal setups, apparently it's used for Kubernetes, and it might be a necessary evil in some cases. Immutable infrastructure seems to be the way to go at the moment, it, but it takes more work to implement, but it gives you a great ability for security, great ability to recreate system. It's great for disaster recovery. You have a fully resilient and self-healing systems. So you can take your hands off the infrastructure and actually focus on the business goals and, and build the tools that business needs to win in the marketplace. What about the tomorrow? What about the future? we might get immutable Kubernetes. I think that like this year, maybe next year, we'll see more in uh, unikernels and microVM. We might, it feels like we are with, with them as we were with the Docker in about 2012, 2013. And uh, serverless might also be something to look at. But again, when it comes to serverless, you have to think, what tools do you use to configure serverless? If you use something like, uh, serverless framework, it's basically configuration synchronization. Maybe you can do better, right? So we should be thinking in those terms, we should be thinking in the theoretical terms and then picking the tool that will get us out of the troubles that you, you might be heading towards. With that, I'm out of time and I want to thank you for tuning in today, listening to this presentation. You have my contact details on the left, there is also the podcast, the last link is a link to the podcast. I will be taking questions in the Discord if, uh, if you are busy right now. So I will be checking it during the day. Or if you have any questions now, I, believe, I hope we have five minutes more to answer them.